In the world of military aviation, one aircraft rules supreme. Built to put American pilots back in charge of the skies, this is the ultimate air superiority fighter, able to climb to the height of Mount Everest in just 60 seconds. Oh, the F-15 is an absolute dream to fly. It was so exhilarating and so sexy and just incredible. It proved its value in both Desert Storm and Operation Iraqi Freedom, flying thousands of successful missions against Saddam Hussein's forces. This jet was sent in at the front of the strike force. Its role, to sweep enemy aircraft out of the skies. I thought it was absolutely magnificent. With a firepower second to none and the maneuverability to outfly its opponents, it now has an amazing track record. Over 100 air-to-air -air kills for no losses. Not one single aircraft has been lost in air-to-air -air combat in over 30 years of service. Whoever controls the F-15 controls the skies. It's the greatest airplane in the world. Using extraordinary archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations flies into combat with the F-15 Eagle. January the 16th, 1991, Operation Desert Storm. American air attacks on Iraq are poised to begin. Flying at the front of a great wave of coalition aircraft are 20 F-15 fighters. 50 miles into Iraq, their radar picks up enemy contacts. Captain John Kelk leads the flight of F-15s, and he is the first to hear the radar warning tone in his headset. Enemy fighters are targeting his plane. Kelk cannot be certain that the aircraft ahead are hostile, but as the jets closed over 1,400 miles per hour, the F-15 pilot is forced to decide, should he shoot to kill? His radar shows a fighter flying aggressively up towards him, so he prepares for combat. Closing his eyes to protect his vision from the anticipated explosion, he slams the pickle button on his stick, launching an air-to-air -air missile. Seconds later, a huge explosion lights up the night sky. Kelk has become the first American to score an air-to-air -air kill in the F-15. 30 years of planning has finally paid off. But the F-15 story begins decades earlier, deep in the Cold War years. 1951, and the Korean War was raging. American F-86 Sabre pilots fought pitched battles with Russian MiGs. These American pilots first learned their dogfighting skills during the dark days of World War II, and in Korea, they achieved an alleged kill ratio of 10 to 1 against the Soviets. The 10 to 1 kill ratio that the F-86 had seemed to be something that uh, was to be aspired to, but would never, never be matched which seemed to be the benchmark. I mean, it was like Babe Ruth hitting uh, 60 home runs in a season. I mean, who, who is ever going to break that record? Once again, the Sabres have proven more than a match for the Red Jets. Chalk up another for the Sabres with no losses of their own. By the Vietnam War, U.S. Air Force pilots were flying F-4 Phantoms against a new generation of Soviet-built MiGs. U.S. Air Force planners decided that the new aircraft would fight at great distances using guided missiles. They believed the age of the dogfight was over. But missiles do not always find their targets, and in fact only 14% of the first AIM-7 missiles ever hit anything. When the Phantom's missiles failed, the fighter was left completely defenseless, as it had no gun. A fighter that doesn't have weapons isn't a fighter. And um, the, the issue with the F-4 in Vietnam, though, was that the Sparrow, the radar-guided missile, and the Sidewinder, the heat-seeking missile that the airplane carried, were designed to be shot against large bomber-sized targets at high altitude. When you take a system designed, optimized for that, and then employ it against small fighter-sized targets, highly maneuvering at lower altitudes, the results are uh, not pretty, and they weren't pretty for us. 
Soviet MiGs flown by the Vietnamese lured F-4s in close, knowing they were soft targets. American pilots were not trained to dogfight. The knowledge acquired in Korea and World War II had not been passed down to this new generation of fighter pilots. The training that I had to go to Vietnam was abysmal. And the uh, new pilots that came into their organizations that were supposed to be there to go fly air to air and uh, dogfight with the MiGs, uh, the training was not even as good as abysmal. It was just, in fact, non-existent. Without a gun and lacking dogfight skills, the American F-4s were dangerously exposed. If you're an F-4 pilot in the midst of a dogfight, you've used up your radar missiles. They all missed, which they always did. And then you fired a few of your infrared missiles, and by bad luck or because you didn't have a good position, they missed. Now you're out of ideas and out of ammunition, and you better go home because you're in trouble. They're going to get you unless you can get out of there because you don't even have a gun to fall back on. The F-4 Phantom had originally been designed to down nuclear bombers. When pushed into a dogfighting role, its limitations became all too clear. The F-4, like like almost all the airplanes that were designed to be electronic radar interceptors had horrible visibility because the designers were totally focused on somebody with his head down in the radar scope, either the pilot or the guy behind him doing that. And all you needed windows for was to take off and land because the radar was going to be your eyes. Well, that's a quick way to a quick death in combat because the guy who kills you is never out front. He's always the guy who's behind you. These mistakes proved costly. Over 3,000 American aircraft were lost during the Vietnam War. For a good part of the war, we didn't get much better than one-to-one -one exchange ratio, which all things considered was a disgrace. The Air Force took it as a disgrace, and it was a disgrace. Air Force planners decided that things must change. They needed the ultimate dogfighting machine, a plane that could achieve air superiority in any theater of action. An initial batch of 500 designs were submitted for the FX, Fighter Experimental Program, but Air Force chiefs were not impressed. The 500 designs that were returned from the first request for proposal were all rejected because they simply did not break the mold. The Air Force urgently needed to regain the aviation advantage. Unexpected developments in Russia suggested that they were losing the race. At the 1967 Moscow Air Show, the Soviets unveiled their next generation fighter, the MiG-25 Foxbat. It would have looked to the intelligence analysts as though this was a force to be reckoned with. It would uh, certainly have put the fear of God into them uh, because you've got an aeroplane that can fly at, uh, up to Mark III, that can climb to um, 60, 70,000 feet, uh, and that is easily going to be able to chase down and, and, and beat uh, any, any fighter that the Americans had to put up against it. Over the next two years, the Soviet fighter smashed several airspeed records. The race was now on to build an American plane that could outfight the Soviet MiG. Little did anyone know that the result would change military history forever. After losing the aviation advantage to the Soviet MiG-25, American aircraft designers went back to the drawing board. Planners realized they needed to recruit somebody who really understood fighter planes. They needed a man with hands-on experience of aerial combat matched with great technical insight. Eventually, they found him. He had honed his combat skills in Korea, but really made his name while developing air-to-air -air tactics at Nellis Fighter Weapons School. His name was Major John Boyd. At that time, he was known as the Mad Major. He was a guy who was totally focused on air-to-air -air combat, had dedicated his whole life to first whipping every other fighter pilot in the Air Force and the other services, and secondly, developing theories on how to do that, brilliant new theories that change the way every Air Force in the world flies. Major Boyd was asked to evaluate the existing Fighter X proposals, the early plans for what would eventually become the new Air Force fighter. They brought this, this uncouth genius to the Pentagon, said, here's what we have for a design, you know, give us your evaluation. And John said, well, I don't know much about airplane design. He said, but I could screw up and do better than this. <laughs> 
Boyd realized that without a completely fresh start, the Air Force would end up with another underperforming plane like the F-4. For once, maneuverability must top the list of design specifications. Boyd needed to get his hands on the most powerful computers of the day. The Air Force did have rare mainframe machines, but bureaucrats denied him access. Inventive as ever, Boyd managed somehow to log unofficial time, working after hours. By now, the mad major's erratic behavior had made him enemies inside the Pentagon. One hostile colonel accused him of stealing one million dollars worth of Air Force computer time. To some senior officers, John Boyd would always be a dangerous maverick. In the end, even though John caused these upheavals and had like unending complaints from every area of the bureaucracy about his behavior and what he was forcing him to do, in the end, the chief of staff always supported him and actually arrived, he actually arrived at quite a brilliant design. John Boyd produced some revolutionary design specifications for the new Fighter X. Three companies were then invited to compete for the chance to build the FX fighter. They each had nine months to produce a polished design. By the 1969 deadline, a clear winner emerged. The contract for the new fighter was awarded to the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. Three years of hard work began at the company. In all, two and a half million man hours went into the design of the aircraft. Finally, on the 26th of June, 1972, the first F-15 rolled out of the St. Louis factory. The following day, the Eagle took its first flight. Rotate. It was immediately clear that this aeroplane broke the mold. The F-15's climb rate was awesome, but it was also an important part of it being an effective interceptor. Uh, from standstill, it could reach a height of 30,000 feet, which is the same height as Everest, um, in a little over 60 seconds. There had also been a revolution in the cockpit, with equipment designed to free a pilot from distractions. Whether attacking or defending, a pilot needs to stay focused on the enemy, not on reading the aircraft's instruments. One radical new piece of kit was intended to simplify flight displays and was known as the HUD. A HUD is a heads-up display and it helps us in so many ways because we don't need to look down for any information. Uh, everything that we do and everything that we need to see is right there in front of us. I mean, you've got your altitude, you've got your airspeed, you've got your Mach number, your G's available, the G's that you're actually pulling, what mode you're in, whether you've got a shot on somebody if you're trying to shoot him with a missile, whether or not you're ready for a bomb to come off. Everything that you need to see is right there in front of you so you don't have to look anywhere else for it. While the HUD projects information onto the canopy, the hands-on throttle and stick, or HOTAS system, means that a pilot should not even have to look down to fire weapons, something crucial in the heat of battle. HOTAS was designed uh, to make it easier on the pilot to be uh, more efficient in the cockpit. With HOTAS being that quick and easy to change from different modes, it, it definitely means a matter of whether you kill your bandit now or you get killed. I think that having the HUD and having HOTAS definitely makes it more strapping the fighter onto you, you become one with the fighter. Pilots who had flown earlier fighters were immediately impressed with the F-15. I remember for the first uh, two or three years that I flew the F-15, having constantly the thought in the cockpit, well, we got this right. Well, we got this right. They are all for different things, and my fellow pilots had the same thoughts. Well, we really fixed this. We really fixed this. Missile technology was also improving rapidly, but even more important was the way these new missiles worked together with the F-15's radar. You can have good missiles, but if you can't target them with a good radar that maintains a lock, that provides accurate ranging information and engagement information, um, then they're not a lot of use. In the F-15, a powerful radar meant that air-to-air -air missiles would be more effective than ever before. If the system worked in the heat of battle, it would be the key to air supremacy. 
the F-15 would be the best. In theory, the Eagle's radar would locate and destroy enemy aircraft before they ever knew what had hit them. To Dick Andering, this system was a revelation. In my F-15 checkout, I remember flying home and telling my instructor pilot, who had been in the other airplane, um, I have over 2,000 hours in the F-4. I have a combat tour in the F-4. I have two tours as a fighter weapons school instructor in the F-4. I have just flown my seventh ride in the F-15. I was never as lethal in the F-4 as I am right now after seven flights in the F-15. Within three years of its first flight, the Eagle had broken multiple records. It took back all eight time to climb records from the MiG-25, the very fighter it had initially been designed to beat. With performance levels like these, foreign countries were quick to express interest in buying F-15s for their own air forces. Israel was the first overseas power allowed to buy, and the experience of one Israeli pilot soon proved how durable the F-15 could be. Captain Zivi Nadivi experienced a pilot's worst nightmare when a training exercise went horribly wrong. He was flying a simulated airfield defense mission and was tasked with intercepting hostile aircraft when disaster struck. I saw what in hindsight was the number three, which is the leader of the second, the rear pair. And he was upside down. And I, I was at around 13, 14,000 feet and I shot a missile. Even though he was upside down, he continued to go up. And I was like this, so it was stomach to wing. We couldn't see each other. And uh, we collided. Big commotion, big bang. The A4 um, basically fireballed immediately. And I found myself with uh, maybe 30 degrees nose down attitude. And the aircraft was spinning. Right after the crash, I told my navigator, prepare to eject, we're going to eject. I opened afterburner, which is a totally opposite instinct when you're spinning towards the ground. Then the roll slowly stopped, and slowly I was able to bring the nose back up. Um, I told my wingman to come close and to inspect me. There was a huge spray of fuel that was being drawn out of the wing, and um, it, it and it basically camouflaged um, what was going on there. Nadevi had survived the mid-air collision, and now had partial control over his plane. He was 10 miles out from the nearest airfield, but hoped he could still land safely. But the pilot could not see what had happened behind the spray of leaking fuel. In reality, his F-15 had been so badly damaged in the collision that he was flying on just one wing. Somehow, he was able to regain control over his aircraft and attempt a landing. I approached the airfield. Um, I crossed the threshold where usually in an F-15 you cross at 130 knots. I crossed at anywhere between 250 to 260 knots. Was landing at approximately twice um, the normal landing speed. I put the tail hook down. Um, there was a cable at about a third of the runway, and we went into that cable. But because of the speed, the, the, the hook is not built for those speeds, and the hook basically tore off the airplane. We stopped maybe 20 feet short of uh, the barrier. As I was running the last 50 knots, um, bleeding off, the, my wingman said, you're not going to believe what you flew on. And I opened the canopy, and I reached back to shake the hand of the navigator. And as I was reaching back, that was the first time that I looked and I saw that I didn't have a wing um, on the right-hand side. 
So it's highly likely that if I would have seen it clearly, I would have ejected, because it was obvious you couldn't really fly an airplane like that. I don't think any other aircraft could have taken that amount of damage or that portion of its, its uh, flight surfaces removed and continued to bring us home safely. The best testament was a good friend of mine who was an F-16 pilot. And he crossed and he saw that there was no wing and his first words was, can I transfer to F-15s? In theory, it should be aerodynamically impossible for an aircraft to fly with one wing missing. McDonnell Douglas sent a team to investigate the incident. Their first inclination was it was a taxiing accident. It couldn't happen in air in the airplane. And only when they later went to analyze it and said, OK, the F-15 has a very wide body, and you fly fast enough, then you're like a rocket, then you don't need wings. The Eagle had done what was thought to be impossible. If a pilot could land an F-15 with just one wing, the plane should be able to endure unimaginable punishment on the battlefield. But nobody could tell at this stage how well the Eagle would perform against the feared MiG-25. The first good look at the MiG-25 came when a Russian pilot, uh, Viktor Belenko, defected in his MiG-25 to Japan. The Japanese and the Americans um, hustled over the aeroplane, they dismantled it on the airfield, and what they saw and what they found was that it was an aircraft that was far less capable than, than they had originally thought. MiG-25s look weak on paper, but the Israeli Air Force was the first to challenge them in a real air battle. Since the creation of the modern state of Israel, the Middle East had been torn by bitter wars. Simmering territorial conflicts between Israel and her Arab neighbors periodically flared into violence. One such conflict broke out in the late 1970s, as Israel and Syria vied for control over the Lebanon. Syria possessed a modern air force with Soviet-supplied planes, MiG-25 Foxbats. The MiG-25, in my opinion, was a teaser. It was a test. I think at that time between the Soviet bloc and the U.S. as to whose technology was better. On the 27th of June, 1979, a group of Israeli phantoms attacked targets on the Lebanese coast. Just as the phantoms completed their strikes, they spotted Syrian MiGs approaching fast. The enemy fighters would be on top of them in seconds. A flight of Israeli F-15 Eagles was protecting the Phantoms, patrolling the skies above them. They immediately hit their afterburners and streaked down towards the hostile MiGs. Each F-15 pilot picked a target and locked on with Sidewinder air-to-air -air missiles. Seconds later, the Sidewinders ripped into the MiGs, instantly vaporizing them. For the very first time, the new American technology had been pitted against Russian MiGs. The result was a great victory for the F-15, with the Eagle scoring five air-to-air -air kills on its first day in battle. The F-15 went on to dominate the skies above the Middle East. In the Lebanon war, the Israeli Air Force basically shot down over Lebanon uh, close to 80 aircraft. And as far as I recollect, there was no air-to-air -air losses um, on the Israeli side. American pilots could only watch this encounter. They still had not had their chance to fly the F-15 in a real conflict. Ten more years elapsed before American fighter planes were called upon once again. On August the 2nd, 1990, Saddam Hussein's troops marched into Kuwait City, looting and pillaging as they advanced. The US response was swift, Saddam could not be allowed to threaten Middle Eastern oil supplies, and there was a clear possibility he would order his troops to advance on Saudi Arabia. He had to be stopped at all costs. Operation Desert Shield was initiated, and one of the first directives was to deploy 166 F-15s to Saudi Arabia. Their job was to protect the northern Saudi oil fields from Saddam Hussein's advancing troops. As I report to you, Air attacks are underway against military targets in Iraq. The F-15 would be critical to the success of the Desert Storm Air War. American F-15 pilots have not yet flown in combat. 
This is their chance to prove they possess the right stuff. In 1991, American F-15s were the first planes sent over to the Gulf region for Desert Storm. Their job was to halt Saddam Hussein's advance and to help liberate the Kuwaiti people. Ranked against the F-15s was the biggest air force in the Middle East. Saddam controlled 550 combat aircraft, including MiG-29 Fulcrums, the very latest high-tech Russian-built fighters. Clearly, this would be a challenging new test for the F-15s. It was to be a meticulously planned air war, with no room for error or confusion. TACC, the US Tactical Air Control Center, drew up a 600-page air tasking order. This document was General Chuck Horner's route map for the air campaign. It listed every sortie, every target, all munitions to be used, and every supporting aircraft. General Horner, he was the uh, designer of the air war, and he worked there in the TACC. Um, he was there every night for you know probably 15, 20 hours a day, practically. And he, or one of his uh, other generals, would come to me sometime and ask me f 15 specific questions, for example, can your airplane hit this target? And they'd show me a satellite photo or a map and a target description, and then I'd give them an answer, yes or no. And most of the time I'd look at it and go, sure, you know, that, that thing's gonna return radar, we've got good coordinates where it is, we can hit it. The goals of the air campaign were first get control of the air, because that enabled all other operations. Then the second goal was to debilitate the uh, Iraqi army so they could not resist our ground forces when they went in to liberate Kuwait. And the third thing we did, which was sort of a side mission, was attack his weapons of mass destruction programs, nuclear, biological, chemical, and the SCUD systems that could deliver them. General Horner assigned two primary roles to the F-15. F-15Cs, the pure air-to-air -air fighters, would ensure air superiority, while the F-15Es, their strike eagle cousins, would bomb heavily defended high-value targets. On the 17th of January, 1991, the plan went into action as President George Bush Sr. ordered a strike against Iraq. Mike Smith was working in the tactical control center. He liaised with the F-15 squadrons, passing them their target information. The first few nights, the big concentration was the fixed scud sites. We wanted to knock out all the fixed scud sites in western Iraq. I believe that Israel threatened to use nuclear weapons in retaliation to a scud attack, say, that carried biological or chemical warhead. And as a result of that, I could see why the immense pressure was put on us about the scud missiles. A wall of metal, a wave of F-15 fighters, was called upon to sanitize Iraqi airspace ahead of the strike force. The Eagles would be kept very busy through the night, fighting at the leading edge of the Desert Storm air battle. We went in as part of the first wave of uh, 24 F-15Es uh, to go in and strike targets, and our targets were fixed scud sites along the western border. Rich Horan's flight sped towards Iraqi airspace. Before they could cross, a difficult operation had to be completed. One of the scariest things was just every feeling it was um, very dark, moonless night, and um, there were a couple people I had close calls with just potential mid-airs with the tanker and each other as you were doing this. Only some very careful flying saved the mission from near disaster. The Eagles still had 200 miles to go before reaching the Scud sites. They now flew very low over the desert. They began targeting long before the Iraqis could even see them. Rich Horan, as a weapon systems officer, was responsible for picking out a missile launch site. We're about 12 miles out from the target, and, and the conversation is this isn't so bad. These guys are asleep. And about that time, all hell breaks loose. And what all hell happens to be is number one's bombs have gone off, and the Iraqi anti-aircraft gunners react to the bombs going off, and the sky is filled with AAA. It is the most impressive fireworks display I've ever seen, which is somewhat the conversation I'm having with the guy I'm flying with, and then the realization that really what I'm looking at is every third to fifth bullet is a tracer. And then it dawns on me the reality of the situation and the fact that they mean us bodily harm. 
In the midst of this intense anti-aircraft fire, Horan stayed focused on his radar, successfully identifying the Scud launch site. What I saw was fixed sight, and as we turned in on the FLIR, our forward infrared scope, you can actually see a tail with a missile on it that, the, that our designation is on. We drop our bombs and come off target. As they came off target, a mighty explosion rocked the Scud site. Horan and his pilot rejoined the other F-15s. All 24 had made it safely through the target area, but they were still deep within Iraqi territory. Suddenly, a new threat appeared on Haran's radar. Could this be one of the feared MiG-29s? And you can see it flying parallel, offset by several miles to our string of airplanes, and then you see it, what is obviously him running an intercept on our aircraft. We lock him up to let him, for his radar warning receiver, to let him know that he is being looked at um, and sort of point at him hoping to get a reaction or to potentially employ our, our AIM-9 missile. And then he essentially turns away. The Iraqi pilot seemed reluctant to attack a large flight of F-15s, but was he just holding back, awaiting his opportunity to strike? At night, I never said I'd be looking behind me, but I was practically unstrapped, standing on the back of the seat, looking to see if this guy was going to run an intercept on us. And probably about a minute or so later, there's a gigantic fireball and which I believe is his aircraft that's actually hit the ground. Lacking the F-15's night flying abilities, the Iraqi pilot probably lost control and flew into the desert. It had been a decisive night for the American F-15s. The Strike Eagles fought their way in and destroyed their targets while the air-to-air F-15C models blooded their talons, shooting down six Iraqi aircraft. They had scored the first air-to-air -air kills from an American Eagle with the opening salvos of Desert Storm. Many Iraqi pilots now realized they could not win and attempted to escape with their planes to Iran. It was a short hop to the safety of the Iranian border, but coalition forces were always vigilant. On one patrol, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Dietz spotted several Iraqi aircraft making a break for Iran. We were given a heads up by the AWACS controller that some Iraqi aircraft had taken off from an airfield north of Baghdad. We got within range to shoot at them. We shot before we got into visual range. The initial missiles that we fired were unsuccessful. So we wound up uh, essentially rolling in behind these four Iraqi aircraft, about a mile and a half behind them, shot them with heat-seeking missiles. The new generation of missiles had a very high accuracy rate, so Dietz was astonished when he saw his shots miss the Iraqi planes. I could see the warheads detonate from the missiles, and then the Iraqi aircraft continued to fly. And I was figuring maybe I was snake bit here that uh, got into such a position and the missiles didn't seem to work. Well, I probably had temporal distortion because just a few seconds later, a little flame started trickling out the back of the aircraft on the left and then some flame trickling out the back of the aircraft on the right. And just a few seconds later, huge fireball followed by the second aircraft doing the same thing. Uh, at that point, uh, I was just about to pronounce myself the world's greatest fighter pilot, at least in my own mind, uh, when I thought maybe I ought to look around and see if there are other Iraqi aircraft flying around. And I remember as I started looking to the left, um, right there, not far from me, within a half mile, was an Iraqi aircraft that uh, had his nose pointed out in front of me, which made me initially think, oh, this guy could shoot me with a gun. Having shot down one Iraqi fighter, Thomas Dietz then spotted another flying straight towards him. He needed to react fast, thinking the enemy might open up with his gun at any second. So in my mind began uh, going over the maneuver I'd have to do to defeat this, this threat is when it, I realized that this was just the front half of an Iraqi aircraft. There was a bunch of flames streaming out the back. The canopy was gone, indicating the pilot had ejected. And I looked over and there is my wingman uh, behind that aircraft and he had shot that down. This pattern of successful shoot downs repeated itself throughout the Gulf War. The Iraqi Air Force, I think they were finished in the first two or three nights. The F-15 was very effective at sweeping 
them out of the sky. And if they had any airplanes, they weren't flying them. Only two F-15s were lost during Desert Storm. That losses were so low was testament to the skill and training of the Eagle pilots. They flew an amazing 2,400 missions in total and ensured that the Iraqi Air Force was largely confined to the ground. The F-15 definitely proved itself in the Gulf War. I think it had a reputation before the Gulf War of being a force you did not want to reckon with. Uh, coming out of the Gulf War, that reputation was clear in everyone's mind worldwide. Kuwait had been liberated and Saddam subdued, but the power struggle in the Gulf region was far from over. The U.S. Air Force continued to fly over Iraqi airspace on operations Northern and Southern Watch. For 12 years, they kept a careful eye on Iraq's military activities. Then suddenly, on September the 11th, 2001, everything changed. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. And freedom will be defended. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. It was relatively obvious to me as a uh, combat pilot that we were going to play some role in, uh, in whatever happened. Uh, at that point, obviously, we didn't know where the, the uh, attacks had come from or who was at fault or, or even what we were going to do about it. Uh, but I was relatively confident that uh, if we were going to take any kind of military action, that F-15Es were going to be part of it, and uh, I was hoping that I'd be able to be part of it as well. Well, after 9-11, obviously being the first time that we as a country have been attacked on our own soil in, in quite some time, every country is, is going to respond uh, when something like that occurs to them. Uh, however, I think it's because of the makeup of our country, the fact that uh, we fight for freedom, and 9-11 was an attack against that freedom. Uh, it did bring us together, and it brought us together in a very good way. Before long, F-15s were at the forefront of President Bush's war on terror, helping to hunt down Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. The role of F-15E in Afghanistan was mostly close air support. They were working in close proximity of, of ground forces, and they relied on the eyes of those guys to, to find Al-Qaeda and be able to determine if, determine if there's a good guy or a bad guy. It was the exceptional range of the F-15E that proved invaluable in the Afghanistan conflict. We hidden targets um, well beyond um, the reaches of the army. We're going to be the long arm of the law. F-15s also worked closely with ground troops, precision bombing targets identified by their army colleagues. Afghanistan was soon liberated from the repressive Taliban regime but trouble was brewing elsewhere. The US Air Force had remained active in the Gulf region for the 12 years since Desert Storm. But by early 2003, it had become clear that Saddam Hussein and President Bush would not reach any understanding over weapons of mass destruction. War broke out again in early March. The Iraqi Air Force increased its activities in the weeks leading up to war, but once hostilities broke out, they seemed to lack the will to fight. We thought that there might be uh, a little bit of opposition in the first day or two of the war. So during the first two days, three days of the war, we parked ourselves right off their airfields, just waiting for them to fly, uh, hoping that they might get airborne and, uh, and being able to take them down, uh, realizing that uh, if they did get airborne, they were going to be dying right off their own airfield because we were right there ready to, uh, ready to shoot them down as soon as they took off. Uh, I'd certainly like to think that uh, after the Iraqi Air Force experience during Desert Storm, that they'd know better than to take off and uh, fight uh, an eagle. I think it's the first time in warfare that there's been an enemy Air Force that didn't turn a wheel. Um, and obviously, he who hesitates is lost, because once he decided not to fly and they stayed on the ground, the bombers went in and then basically picked them off one by one. 
Only the Iraqi pilots could really say why they did not fly against the coalition forces. Perhaps they hoped to preserve their air force for future use under a new regime. Uh, one of the things that they were doing, which uh, we weren't quite sure why, uh, they started burying their aircraft in the sand. Maybe they were trying to send a message that they didn't plan on flying, uh, but as they were burying their aircraft in the sand, we, we continued to, uh, to take those aircraft out as well. After assuming air superiority, the F-15s then turned their attention to helping out their army colleagues on the ground. And we were merely a support asset for the guys on the ground that were going to march from Kuwait to Baghdad. And our job was to move the Iraqi armor out of the way. It was the Strike Eagle's ability to drop precision laser-guided bombs that would then prove vital. We encircled Baghdad on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 hours a day, and rained GBU-12s, for the most part, onto tanks, armor, armor personnel carriers, uh, and even a couple of their uh, airborne assets uh, when we could find them, and uh, effectively uh, made it easy, hopefully, for our uh, army bros on the ground to march into Baghdad. This high-tech combination of air and ground forces was devastating. American troops reached the outskirts of Baghdad just 14 days after the start of the war. After the past 12 years of doing Operation Northern Watch and Operation Southern Watch, uh, we've wanted to take care of business. And while this was not an excuse uh, to go in and, and liberate a country, uh, Saddam was a truly evil man, and, and what he did to that country, uh, he did need uh, to be taken, taken out of the equation. Uh, so I'm glad that we had the, the tools and the leadership uh, to make that happen. The F-15 played a major part in the defeat of Saddam. But in an unstable world, new conflicts could soon break out. American F-15s are ready to deploy anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. We want to make sure that we can deter any threat. Uh, we're continually making sure that when we go out and train, uh, that we will be the best on the block, that, that nobody can challenge us, and that every time we go out, we will have air supremacy, that we will own the sky and own the battlefield. No other aircraft has rivaled the Eagle for air supremacy, but new fighters are being developed and may one day surpass the F-15. Meanwhile, new technology and continuous training will help the Eagles to stay at the top of their game. I want to go out and I want to be able to uh, totally dominate the enemy. If, if we're going to have a fight, I don't want it to be a fair fight. Uh, we want to go out and we want to dominate. And that's why uh, we train as hard as we do uh, to make sure that we can maintain that perfect record of 104 to nothing. As a fighter pilot, you'll, you'll never admit that there's anybody better. Uh, and as an American fighter pilot right now, I don't think there's anyone that can say they are. But our whole thing is uh, when we go out, we expect to win. The record of 104 air-to-air -air kills for not one single F-15 loss is unique. Can any other Air Force challenge the Eagles today? The kill ratio of the F-15 is beyond uh the kind of thing that you would ever think possible. I mean, surely someone would make a mistake or someone would just blunder out in front of an, another airplane and get shot down just because it wasn't his day. But the experience of the Israeli Air Force and the U.S. Air Force with the F-15 in combat is uh, magnificent. Interestingly, I had no desire to be a pilot in my younger days. And then while I was a student at the Air Force Academy, I uh, received a backseat ride in F-15. And it, as soon as I landed from that mission, I knew that that's what I would want to do. If someone would pay me to do this, if I could make a living flying this airplane, uh, that would be fabulous. And that was a real turning point in my life. It was really the start of my professional career, I think. I was stationed at Bitburg Air Base, Germany, back in 1991, when the Gulf War kicked off. My squadron was tasked to deploy to Saudi Arabia 
to provide air superiority for U.S. forces or coalition forces as uh, in the effort to liberate Kuwait. As Desert Storm progressed, going to bed the, the night before the war started, I expected to wake up in the morning and some of my squadron mates that flew that first night to have come back after shooting down five or six or seven Iraqi aircraft. When most of them came home without having shot down anything, I was quite surprised. As the war progressed, and there were a few engagements, a few more engagements, it became apparent that there weren't going to be many engagements. And now it was more like a situation of who was going to be so fortunate as to actually have the opportunity to, to uh, do what we had trained for over so many years. I've flown the F-15C model, the, actually the A through C model, which is uh, strictly an air superiority, an air-to-air -air fighter aircraft. I uh, have a little over 3,000 hours of flying that airplane. And like I said, it's, it's strictly an air-to-air -air combat aircraft. It doesn't carry air-to-ground weapons. Uh, it carries up to eight air-to-air -air missiles as well as a 20 millimeter cannon. And we focus exclusively on the ability to shoot down other airplanes. That's our mission. My wingman and I, approximately three weeks into the war, we were on combat air patrol trying to prevent Iraqi aircraft from flying to Iran. We were given a point out or a heads up by the AWACS controller that some Iraqi aircraft had taken off from an airfield north of Baghdad. We immediately headed northbound to try to intercept them before they got to Iran. Uh, we got within range to shoot at them uh, approximately 10 miles away and we were cleared by the AWACS controller to shoot that they were in fact hostile aircraft. We shot before we got into visual range and then proceeded in closer and wound up uh, actually very close to them. Uh, the initial missiles that we fired were uh, unsuccessful. So we wound up uh, essentially rolling in behind these four Iraqi aircraft that were flying very low, I would say a hundred feet off the ground, and we rolled in about a mile and a half behind them, shot them with heat-seeking missiles that uh, came off the rails of our airplanes, uh, flew out and uh, engaged the enemy aircraft. I could see the warheads detonate from the missiles, and then the Iraqi aircraft continued to fly, which gave me pause for concern. I was, uh, maybe pause for concern. I was uh, figuring maybe I was snake bit here that uh, got into such a position and the missiles didn't seem to work. Well, I probably had temporal distortion because just a few seconds later, a little flame started trickling out the back of the aircraft on the left and then flame trickling out the back of the aircraft on the right. And just a few seconds later, one of the aircraft impacted the desert floor and a huge fireball that reminded me of pictures of napalm exploding that I had seen from Vietnam uh, occurred, followed by the second aircraft doing the same thing. Uh, at that point, uh, I was just about to pronounce myself the world's greatest fighter pilot, at least in my own mind, uh, when I thought maybe I ought to look around and see if there are other Iraqi aircraft flying around. And I remember as I started looking to the left, uh, um, Right there, not far from me, within a half mile, was an Iraqi aircraft that uh, had his nose pointed out in front of me, which made me initially think, oh, this guy could shoot me with a gun. So as I, in my mind, began uh, going over the maneuver I'd have to do to defeat this, this threat is when it, I realized that this was just the front half of an Iraqi aircraft. There was a bunch of flames streaming out the back. The canopy was gone indicating the pilot had ejected and I looked over and there's my wingman uh, behind that aircraft and he had shot that down. Uh, I looked a little further to the north and there was another aircraft that uh, my wingman, wingman uh, Giggs, Bob Giggs Heeman, had shot down and so as we uh, shot down a total of four aircraft that day and I asked him if he saw anything else he said no and and we egressed the, the fight, went back to our cap and stayed there for uh, a few more hours actually. My wingman and I 
had another opportunity to engage some Iraqi aircraft, and this was after the ceasefire had been signed. So it was late March of 91. We were patrolling the no-fly zone north of Baghdad when we encountered a few, or two Iraqi aircraft, which we uh, rolled in behind them. As it turns out, uh, these aircraft were up bombing the Kurds. I rolled in behind what was identified as a Su-22 fitter, which is a fighter bomber. I rolled into about a half a mile behind him and shot a heat-seeking missile that uh, flew right up the tailpipe of this airplane, and, and the aircraft blew up like you see in the movies. There was not a discernible piece. I, there was no way I could identify the aircraft after the missile had exploded. At that point, my wingman tells me that he's behind another Iraqi aircraft, and the pilot has ejected from the airplane. As it turns out, it was a PC-9 turboprop aircraft, and that pilot was the forward air controller for the fighter bomber that I had just shot down. And evidently, that Iraqi pilot was not interested in waiting around to find out if we were going to shoot him down. So he ejected, and my wingman flew right by him as he descended in his parachute, and we followed his aircraft for a few more miles until it impacted the desert floor. And so that was quite an interesting story, an interesting turn of events. Uh, it, was, it was especially interesting to hear the communications back and forth between my wingman and myself. Fighter pilots are constantly making mistakes. The idea is to make small mistakes and to try to not repeat your mistakes over and over again. That's why it's so critical that we train frequently and that you fly a lot, especially as a young fighter pilot, because you have to make these moves with the stick and the throttles and all the buttons on them. It has to be second nature. You don't have time to think about each switch and well, then I'll put this here if that happens. Air-to-air -air combat is an extremely dynamic environment, and decisions are made in split seconds that result in survival or death. Number 22, Galena Ground, taxi to runway 25, when calm, altimeter 29 or 9 or 1. Alpha Papa 22. Alpha Papa 22 Tower, change to departure, when calm, clear for takeoff, runway 25. Flight or radar contact. Check weapons safe. Climb Angels 35. Vector 330. Set speed Mach 0.83. Mission refuel. Alpha 2 2. Weapon safe. Alpha 0 3. Weapon safe. Alpha 2 2. Weapon safe. Weapon safe. Alpha Papa 2 2. Tactical rendezvous. Tanker call sign gas 30. 270 knots indicated. Flight level 270. Squawking mode 3. 3630. Alpha Papa 2 2. Alpha Papa 22, flight contact boomer now 288.8. Alpha Papa 22. ID 2568. Alpha 22. Papa 22, two contacts tracking 030 21000. Papa 22. Papa 22, descend Angels 23. ID by type, aircraft only, report any unusual activity, external armament or hazard. Alpha Papa 22. Papa 22, right 030, final turn, bogey 344.
Alpha Papa 22 flight, come off south, vector 140, Angels 35, mission RTB. Alpha Papa 